Yeah. And I'll make you host, Darcy, before I go. Okay. And um, um, does everyone have the ability to screen share? Yes, Veroni was able to check and make sure that um, hers was working before we began. Okay, and Mandy Jo is going to need to also. Um, yeah, she's a panelist, so she should be able to as well. Okay, great. Thank you, Athena. You're welcome. Good evening. I'm Darcy Dumont. I'm calling the June 24th, 2021 meeting of the Town's Service and Outreach Committee to order at 631. Governor Baker's March 12th, 2020 order suspending certain provisions of the open meeting law allow us to hold this virtual meeting. You can view the recording of the meeting on the town YouTube channel. I'm gonna call each member by name. At that time, we can confirm that we can hear each other. Um, Alisa Brewer. Present. Dumont, yes. Evan Ross. Present. George Ryan. Present. Andy Steinberg. Veronique. Oh, sorry. Yes. Hi. Great. Right. This is this is Veronique Blanchard, everyone. Um, so I am looking at this is a time for public comment. It, it looks like someone might be here. Let's see. Um, it is time for public comment. If the public would like to give a comment, please um, hit the raise hand button. Doesn't look like public comment right now. Um, now, uh, there's Paul. Hi. <laughs> Um, we're going to uh, go right to our town manager appointments, and Paul has some recommendations about the Conservation Commission. Uh, thank you. Um, I just need to pull up the, the... So you have the memo in front of you. Um, sorry, don't have it set up. And so one is a reappointment of uh, Mr. Ams. And then we have an appointment of um, the person's name who I- Michelle LeBay or something? Mich Michelle LeBay, yes. Um, and I think of, here we go, a very strong appointment, um, ex uh, extensive experience in conservation area um, uh, is an Amherst High School and um, a UMass Amherst graduate with master's degree from UMass Amherst as well has um, uh, is a um, does work for a nonprofit um, and has um, just her the skill set that she brings is just really remarkable uh, used to working in, in a um, regulated area at state local and federal levels um, used to reading contracts and, and interpreting how regulations get applied, um, has really strong um, uh, um, environmental um, skills and science skills. Um, just one of, one of the strongest candidates I've ever seen for Conservation Commission. She looked very good. Mm -hmm. Any um, questions from the counselors? And just to, to add, she's will be taking the place of Brett Butler, who has served two terms, and will be, you know, terming off. Okay, thank you. Um, but if there are no questions or discussion, I, I'll move. Oh, Aunt Alyssa. Oh, it's just a um, <clears throat> one of our clerical errors where um, Paul has already been advised. The section in the memo that shows the charter that says, you know, his authority to do this under the charter is also needing to have added to it the section that shows that we gave the notice to people, but um, it was just an old cut and paste apparently, but that'll get, I've asked that that be checked for further inclusion because obviously he's got even more of these coming forward to us and he did include the actual notice to the public from the website. So we're covered that way. 
So I will amend them just so I don't, because I usually do cut and paste. I'll amend this one and put a, a slight reference on it before it goes into the council packet. Great. Thank you, Paul. All right. Um, if that is all, I move to recommend the town council to the town council the following town manager recommendation for appointment to the Conservation Commission for a three year term expiring June 30th, 2024. Lawrence Ams, a reappointment, and Michelle LeBay, an appointment. Anyone like to second that? Second. I second it. Okay. Any, any more questions or discussion? All right. Alyssa. Aye. Darcy, yes. Um, Evan. Aye. George. Aye. Andy. All right. Um, okay, so that's uh, unanimous approval. I'll send that recommendation to the council, which I think will take it up on Monday. Okay, I am going to um, move agenda item four to after number five, unless there's some big objection to it. Um, that's the town manager report and update um, because we want to make sure that um, we have enough time for both Veronique's report and the surveillance technology. Um, so, uh, Guilford, are you here? Yes. Um, just wondering if you or, or Paul uh, would like to just brief, you know, give a brief um, introduction to what the technical assistance grant was and Introduce Veronique. I could also do it if you want me to, but I think it makes more sense for you to do it. <laughs> I'll wait to see if Paul went. No, I'm not going to say. <laughs> oh, that's true. Paul, Paul, would you like to do it? <laughs> okay. I, um, so we have Veronique with us, and uh, she is actually the our Murph, and not our Murph, but our. EEP representative for recycling in the Western region. Uh, she has the job for one more day, I believe. And then she's <laughs> moving on to bigger and better things. Um, this is um, a grant we got, which is a um, services grant. There's no money involved. It's just time from DEP. And what we did with it was we looked at other communities to see how they handle their waste streams and how they handle waste in their communities. So Veronique chose several and we agreed upon them and then she put together this little report but it basically covers what other communities are doing with their waste and um, possible things that we might be able to, to think about doing in the future. Thank you. Hi. Thank you very much for that Guilford. Um, yes so I am Bernie Blanchard. I am as Guilford said for one more day the um, municipal assistance coordinator with Mass DEP for the western region which means I cover the four counties in Western Mass, um, anything to do with solid waste and recycling. So let me, and thank you so much for having me here tonight. This is um, a subject very near and dear to my heart. So let's see if I can do this properly. Okay. All right. Um, looks like it's working. So yes, yeah, so this was um, a technical assistance grant that was asked for through the, through Guild for the DPW and also through um, and with assistance from Zero Waste Amherst. Let me just see here, my clicker is there, it wasn't showing up. All right, good, this is working. All right, so um, the purpose of the study is to um, look at Amherst system right now, what's happening with the system right now, but also to research other towns and see what alternatives um, might be able to be considered by Amherst in the future. So right now, the situation is that in Amherst, you do have um, the transfer station, but you also have um, private subscription. So the other way, other ways that you could um, structure your solid waste services would be either contracting directly with a hauler or deciding to have the town take over the services themselves. So the whole goal here is to figure out what are the best practices um, that Amherst could adopt to reduce waste. <clears throat> So why do you look into zero waste in the first place? Well, one of the big things is that it is an easy way to um, incorporate climate action strategies that um, 
will help a community to conserve. And, you know, here's just the typical sort of hierarchy. First, you want to reduce and conserve and um, encourage uh, recycling and designing products differently and then reusing them and recycling them. And then hopefully you have very little to regulate and disposal. Um, so, and I'm sure you all are familiar with these, but this is, when I was growing up, it was the three R's, you know, and they've just expanded them phenomenally since then with all kinds of R's. So um, basically the idea is, do you, do you really need it in the first place? Can you make do without it? Um, can you reduce the amount of reduce that you, um, of waste that you create? Can you fix it? Can it be used for something else? And then can it be recycled or can you compost it? And my favorite old New England saying, use it up, wear it out, make it do or do without. So um, this slide is one of my favorites. This data comes from, there are six waste combustors in Massachusetts and DEP gets a, what they call waste characterization study from these combustors annually, which basically just means that they send to DEP the data on what was in the trash that was brought to their facility. And if you look at this, it, to me, it's rather incredible because most of this stuff shouldn't be in the trash in the first place. You know, certainly we could deal with organics differently. Paper, you know, shouldn't be in there. If you can't recycle it, it should be composted. This is probably one that's difficult because a lot of the plastics that are in here are plastics that simply aren't recyclable. So that's one issue. Um, construction and demolition or C&D should be dealt with in a different way, really. But um, I'm not sure what's in the other, but we definitely should not have hazardous waste, metal, glass, or electronics in the trash. So if you add up all these percentages, you can see that there's a huge uh, amount that should not be going into the trash in the first place. So why is it important to know what's in your trash? Well, if you don't know what's in your trash, you can't really know how to address it. Um, and so, you know, you need to know what's there so you can address each item and try to figure out how to reduce what's going into your waste stream. Um, so the goal is to obviously reduce the amount of, of trash and um, communities which have the highest diversion rates, which keep the most trash out, tend to be the ones which provide the most services to their residents, either directly or indirectly through partnerships or some other arrangement. So um, I meant to say before I started that if I throw out some jargon here and, and there's a term you don't um, you know, understand, um, which of course we all tend to do in government, right? So please stop me and just ask me, but this here is just an explanation of pay as you throw, um, which is also called SMART, which is save money and reduce trash. And the idea is that every um, person who is producing trash pays for the amount of trash they produce. For instance, you don't go into the grocery store and buy a bag of um, potatoes for, at five pounds for the same price as 10 pounds. So the idea is that the more waste you produce, the more you're gonna pay for it. And I just wanted to point out here that Mass DEP does have funding to help towns starting any kind of pay up, pay as you throw program. And um, if you have questions about the grants later, I'm, I'm happy to ask those too. So, um, why is the pay as you throw so important? Well, I'm about to show you a couple of slides on um, how much we throw away in Massachusetts. And you will see that the numbers there is for towns that don't have any kind of limit on the trash that be, can be thrown away. The typical amount is um, 1,646 pounds per household per year. For towns that do have some kind of waste reduction program, it's down to 1,086 which is a difference of 560 pounds or almost a 35% reduction in solid waste. So you can see that pays you throw really does reduce the amount of trash that people throw away. It makes them think about it, right? You know, you're gonna pay for how much you get rid of. Um, so you, that kind of forces people to think of other ways to deal with it. So this, we're, they're about to come out with the 2020. Um, and for those of you who deal with this kind of information, this is when the towns report to us on their solid waste and recycling surveys annually, the towns who participate in MassDEP programs um, that report to us. Um, 
So this is where, you know, this is where we get all this data from. And you can see that the, the bright red is kind of like the worst and the green is the best. So we're pretty good out here um, in Western Mass. Um, and I don't have, sorry, I can't even read here how much Amherst is. Apologize, I can't get close enough. <laughs> and then you can see here how many, pay, how many communities in Massachusetts have already adopted pay as you throw, which is quite a few. So now um, in the beginning, I was saying that the current program that you have is um, private subscription, which means that everybody picks their own hauler. Um, the thing that's happened recently is that all the haulers were, the other haulers were bought up by USA and now you just pretty much have USA for your residential pickup. Um, there is, um, and you know, so you have a lot of multifamilies and apartments here, which I'm sure you already know. Your transfer station serves 2,340 households out of the households within um, Amherst. And you do have on the books right now a board of health regulation that was approved in 2014, which states that um, the waste haulers that operate in town must offer residential um, commercial customers recycling services and a unit-based user fee system by weight or volume. So that unit-based really does pretty much mean the same kind of thing as we're talking about as pays you throw or a waste reduction program, because they're supposed to be charging for the size of the container. Now, enforcement um, is, I don't know if that's actually happening at the moment. I don't think so because of some anecdotal evidence that I've heard, but the enforcement can be done according to this regulation by the town or the Board of Health, the police department and the DPW. So these were the towns that were selected to research. And um, here I have what type of service they provide to their um, residents. So, so you can see it's, it's a mix all over. Um, some were contracted for recycling and did municipal trash. Some were municipal for recycling and private subscription for trash. Some were just straight contracted directly with the haulers. Some were all municipally run. Um, and then Portland, which is so big, was a residential franchise where the city is split up into sections and each section is, is um, contracted out to a different uh, company. So what are, uh, we've, we've been through this pretty much, but the best practice in trash reduction is doing some sort of pay as you throw program um, with a limit of 35 gallons or less per week. That's kind of like the gold standard and, and certainly what DEP is looking for. Um, so you can see some of the programs here, that's what they do. They um, they do provide different size um, uh, carts or gallons and you pay according to the size of the cart. So, um, so what? one thing I wanna back up, I, I apologize, I should have said this earlier. I, I believe in your packet, you will have um, some uh, information that, I don't know if you can see this, probably not. Okay, they're, they're all um, information sheets on each of the towns that I researched. So. In this presentation, it's just kind of a, an amalgamation of it, but you can go back to all of these individual towns in Arbor or Austin or Burlington and look up in depth the information that's provided here for later on. So the best practices in recycling are that you provide recycling for free, that you give people unlimited capacity, free containers. Um, and I will say here that dual stream does tend uh, okay, let me let me back up just to make sure everybody understands. Dual stream is when you have paper and cardboard in one container and bottles and cans in the other. And single stream is when it's all mixed together. It does tend to produce a cleaner, less contaminated product in dual stream, um, but there are reasons for using one or the other. Um, so here are some of the programs that, um, you know, and a lot of them, if they have it mandatory, that was also really important. And you can see the size of the carts um, are, you know, tend to be large. So that's the best practice for recycling, um, municipal and private. And then in contracted, it was the same, it was the same thing. Basically, the more capacity you give people, the more they're going to recycle and the less they're going to throw away. So for organics, um, 
in organics, we are considering yard waste as well as food scraps and compostable products. Um, they tend to not be put together in the same um, part in most of the programs that I saw. All of the towns that were surveyed at least had drop-offs for yard waste, which is basically leaves, grass, and brush. Um, and some towns also collected at curbside. So that was pretty much a given, which is nice to see. But there were also quite a few that collected food scraps at the curb, and that's really um, huge. When we were looking at that trash can of the different percentages of um, waste that was in there, organics is, or the, the um, yeah, the organics is such a huge part of it, that if you can get that out, um, that will reduce your trash um, by a great amount. And just to mention Burlington, um, Vermont has passed this universal recycling law, which you may or may not have heard of, but it's, it bans all food scraps from the trash. So the entire state now has banned that. Um, and I'll, I'll get a little later into the presentation about what we do in Massachusetts about that. So just here, here are some more that this is how they, they deal with their organics. Um, if it can be put under the program and the resident doesn't you know, necessarily pay directly, of course, um, that's always better too. I, I'm not quite sure why, but for some reason, people don't seem to notice when it's in their taxes. But if, you know, if it's separate, they seem to, to notice. So, um, and, and all of the towns that were surveyed did provide organics except for Somerville, but they're looking into it. Bulky wastes are also a big part of the waste stream that needs to be managed. Um, and every community had some kind of outlet for these. And sometimes these get picked up curbside, sometimes they're at a drop-off center, but it's really important to give people an outlet for those materials and they do tend to be charged for. Household hazardous waste, if you're remembering back to that trash can, this is another one and another very important thing to keep out of the waste stream. And every single one of the towns that surveyed, was surveyed um, did participate and I know Amherst participates in the Pioneer Valley Regional um, Reciprocal Arrangement for Hazardous Waste. So that's great. Veronique, um, yeah. can we pause and take Alyssa's question? Oh, I'm so sorry. I, I had that up so I could see my, my screens. I apologize, of course. That would be really helpful. And in fact, you just sort of answered it in the last thing you said. One of the things I'm finding a little bit difficult to follow here is that we do a lot of these things already. Now, obviously we don't do um, uh, curbside composting of scraps, but we're never mentioned on the charts as like what Amherst does versus all the other communities that we're right. compared to. And so we do most of these things. And I, I feel like I'm getting it presented as good people do these things and then there's Amherst. <laughs> oh, no, 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 I'm sorry. that. Um, so when you can work in that part about like how we have that agreement, uh, mm -hmm. that's just incredibly helpful because it's obvious that you just have all this information at your fingertips. So if you could just remind us, because we may not all know all those details, especially since the haulers all got consolidated into one because people right. had different experiences in different parts of town, depending on who they were using. So thank you right. so much for just reminding us like as you get to that oh yeah and what you guys right. do is this right that would be right you you do i mean amherst does have offer quite a few things and you have a transfer station which is a huge benefit um i i think i would say probably the the fact that it's private subscription and as such the town has absolutely no control over um what's happening for the residents with regard to the solid waste pickup that to me is something that, you know, that's kind of like the biggest piece of the puzzle in all, in all honesty. Um, as I mentioned before, getting to that like 35% reduction by doing some kind of um, pay as you throw or some kind of waste reduction program really would be huge um, for, um, for managing waste. So, and again, you do have a transfer station, which is wonderful was one of the first ones I ever visited and I just love it. Um, and uh, a lot of these materials, again, if residents don't have a way to get rid of this, this is really important. Um, all of us know that, you know, we all have these things in our homes and people are always trying to figure out how to get rid of them. Um, so it's, it's really great that you have a lot of these offerings already in Amherst. 
Um, another one of those options that really helps people in terms of keeping things out of the trash is reduce, reuse and repair. I'm not sure how familiar any of you are with um, fix it clinics or repair cafes, but there are quite a few and they're worldwide at this point. I'm going to apologize here because I have a dog, very old dog and a cat in my lap. <laughs> She's about to bark. Yes, sorry. Um, I'm sorry. She's very old and it's hard to get her. Old. But you can see here that um, a lot of the, the places that were considered, you know, exemplary for getting as close to zero waste as they can all had some kind of repair or reuse events going on. And that's something that I think is, is really important too. I don't know if any of you have ever um, heard of the ones Northampton runs, but they do have one at the Smith Vocational School, which I don't, they may be doing it virtually, but they were doing it in person for a long time. And a lot of these are actually, since COVID, a lot of these are actually being done now just online um, as another option for people. So that's something to look into. And um, outreach and education, you know, it's funny because so often we're, we're all aware that everything needs to have outreach and education and we all talk about it, but then actually developing a program for how you're going to let people know about things is absolutely key. Once you've made a decision about what you're doing or what your goals are, it's so important um, to actually have a plan of how you're gonna educate your people. And one thing I wanted to mention and that I learned this over the last 10 years is that every year that goes by, um, the social media tells us that it takes more and more repetitions of information for people to actually get it, what's being said to them. I think it's because we're bombarded every day with so much information. Um, we had done some radio ads, ads through the Murph Advisory Board and we were coached on how many times we had to repeat those radio, radio ads before people would even have it sink in. So I just wanted to mention that I, I know as um, government officials, we tend to feel like, well, we've put the information out. Why aren't people getting it? But I wanted to make the point that repetition is, it may seem like it's overkill, but it's not. <laughs> so, um, And one of the other big things that I think for moving forward, if Amherst chooses to go in this direction, is, is picking a goal and deciding what what your goals will be and then actually codifying it put it putting it into some kind of plan um, most of the communities that i researched did have some and some huge documents um, that really spelled out everything that they were doing to try to um, reduce waste and to recycle so even if it's just starting with i mean you would have you have a, a mandatory recycling i believe because you were using the the springfield murf um, but that's something to really consider. And I don't know um, which group it is in Amherst now that would be, I know, um, Guilford, maybe you can tell me there was the reuse and recycling or whatever group. And I, I can't remember how that ended up. There is no committee right now. There isn't. Okay. Okay. All right. Yeah, I knew it was, they were talking about restructuring it when Amherst got restructured, but um, in any case, that's that's something I would I would look at is is once you've decided upon the goals to definitely codify um, what it is you, you you plan to do and outline it so everybody understands. Um, and partnerships are actually something that I found um, really interesting with a lot of the towns. In some of them, there were very strong nonprofits that have been started back you know forty years ago. And I think the residents who were involved with this nonprofit that was working on recycling and other issues um, kind of helped push the needle, so to speak, with the government by basically sort of showing them how to do it. And then they developed partnerships between the nonprofit and the government and would you know, contract out to this nonprofit these services. Um, we don't necessarily have that right here, right now, um, and a lot of the partnerships were between the city and the county, but that's definitely something that's worth exploring, um, particularly in, you know, regionally. There might be a few towns nearby that are interested in, in working on compost together or, um, you know, any number of, of issues where, you know, working together, <laughs> excuse me, regionally would help 
sort of share and shift the burden a little bit and create great programs. <laughs> um, and then there were some really interesting financial mechanisms um, that I saw here. And basically there, it was some version of levying a fee um, that everybody paid for. And then that money was used to fund um, solid waste services. And let, you know, for instance, just to pick this one here, um, Burlington, has the solid waste generation tax at $4.84 um, per household per month. And that generates an awful lot of money for them to be able to use on these different projects. So I just thought that was an interesting way of uh, looking outside of the just general taxation box. And, and enterprise funds, of course, are used often um, for trash services. I used to be in South Hadley, we had an enterprise fund and we had a trash fee that covered everything, um, that both the transfer station and the curbside pickup. So um, just some interesting uh, financial alternatives. So the way Massachusetts, in, in, just in case you all are not aware of this, the way Massachusetts deals with keeping things out of the trash is not actually by telling you we don't have a mandatory recycling law in Massachusetts. We have waste bans, basically meaning that you just can't throw it away. Um, and these were the ones that started, they started in 1990 and here are the basic ones. So right here where it says single resin narrow neck plastic, you know, containers, I guess it is, I can't see it right now. Um, that's basically your, your bottles, right? Um, so, but it's interesting that the language that they have in here, but so these are the things that are actually banned from being disposed of in Massachusetts. Now, the um, DEP has been working on their draft solid waste master plan. They produce one every 10 years, which states their goals and, and, um, and plans for the next decade. They're, they're done with um, the draft and I believe they're done with all the comment periods. So now we're just waiting for the final to come out. They have proposed um, uh, a um, ban, sorry, hang on a second. I'm just trying to look here. Okay, so the, they've proposed these three bans, um, one to be just altered and two new ones. Right now, we do have a um, waste ban. If somebody, a business or whoever produces more than a ton of week of food, that has to be composted and they're considering moving it to a half ton per week. Um, or that's what's in the, in the draft um, solid waste master plan. Um, and also they're going to add in mattresses and textiles. Uh, so these are, um, you know, more programs to think about in the future. When, when this does become effective, then everybody's gonna have to have a way to actually recycle these and not throw them away and um, uh, expand any kind of textile program that you might have. There are quite a few companies um, that are uh, increasing their presence in Massachusetts because of these things. Um, so those are just some things to keep in mind for the future, but that of course will be great because it'll be recycling things that would be going into the trash. And textiles, it just amazes me how much actually gets thrown into the trash. It's, um, it's a little strange, but. So just a reminder that those are the things we're trying to keep out and um, you know, so we went through a lot of these materials uh, already, things that just shouldn't be in there. So in terms of, oops, I'm sorry. I was trying to click on my screen here. So just to the summary here, and I'm not gonna read through all of these for you again, cause I'd really rather get to questions and, and see what is on people's minds. But, um, you know, basically it's everything that you can do here with your trash to do pay as you throw, give as much recycling as possible, um, try to get organics um, uh, taken care of, your bulky waste, your increasing your reuse and repair. Um, so yes, so we went through all of these. All right, so there's the conclusions. If the goal is to promote, promote solid waste reduction, um, if you had either a municipally run or a contracted service, it would provide you the most control in reaching that goal. Again, as I mentioned earlier, because right now 
it's private subscription. So Amherst has nothing to um, kind of hold on to, to say, no, we have to have our, our residents recycle and um, um, compost and reduce their trash. So um, there's a couple of what, you know, if you, if you were to go into that, um, I guess my suggestion would be to um, go out to bid first, just because there's a lot of information that Amherst does not have, for instance, how much tonnage is currently collected by USA um, and how many trucks would it take and the routes and all that sort of thing. So, you know, it's just a suggestion, but you could do it as a, as a contract for a few years and then decide to move into municipally run if that's what Amherst chooses to do. Um, and that I, you know, I think the transfer station is wonderful and it would really be essential to keep that going and maybe even um, include some extra items at the transfer station. And then of course, um, enforcement and education and contract management will be the key to success. So I believe that's it. I will stop sharing and see if anybody has any questions. <laughs> Thank you, that was great. Why don't you go ahead and directly call on people, Veronique? I see Alyssa and Andy's hands up. Oh, okay, all right. Um, Alyssa, <laughs> I don't know who with their hand up first, I'm sorry. Thank you, that's awkward, isn't it? Um, <laughs> could you tell us a little more, just based on all your experiences working with all these different folks, we stopped having our own trash hauling, I don't know how many decades ago. Um, we generally do not want to start having more town employees. That's mm -hmm. kind of a rule of thumb. Okay. So are you familiar with any, and I know some people have said, well, but that's the obvious solution to all this, but do you have any experiences or could point us at any particular places that said they did the same thing? Like they stopped having municipal trash service, they moved to private haulers and they moved back because it's really hard for me to just look at this as even a possibility without some sense that it's actually worked effectively someplace else to have moved back into the municipal way. Into the municipal, I honestly, I can't tell you. I don't know if that happened in Holyoke or not. We. There aren't all that many communities here or Chicopee that, that do a municipally run. Um, and again, that's one of the reasons why I think contracting might be the way to go to start because you haven't done it. it, it, it to be honest, I didn't even realize Amherst did have their own uh, municipal program way back when. So, um, but if it hasn't been done in that long, I, you know, I just think there are a lot of kinks that could be worked out through a contract first. Um, but honestly, that's a decision for Amherst to make, I can't really recommend it. I can say that I think in order to reduce your solid waste, the best thing to do is either to do it yourself or to contract it out. Um, Cause otherwise I, you just, you're not, you're not gonna have the control. And if you bid it out, you know, it, it might be interesting to see just how many um, companies came to the table um, because there are plenty around, um, you know, and just to give the example of South Hadley, you know, they, they do contract it out. Um, and I have seen, uh, for instance, in Agawam, um, the woman who uh, runs the program there, when she put out her RFP, I think she had like six or eight options that she put in there for the bid. Like the town said, okay, these are all the different options we want you to consider. And they had to give a quote for each of the six or eight options, which was really interesting. So they could compare, you know, how much it was going to cost them. So really it comes down to deciding, I would say, deciding what services do you want to see happen and then figuring out how you're going to get there. Oh, sorry. Andy? Andy? Um, hmm? Yeah. Yes, hi, that was a great presentation. So thank you. Um, and I guess I have to go back to Alyssa just out of curiosity because I've lived here for 40 years and uh, we were um, offered two different private hauler contracts when I moved here. So it certainly has been a long time um, that because uh, it had to be more than 40 years that we've uh, since we've had the town pickup. Um, but my questions aren't about that, uh, because that's an internal thing here. The, 
towns that, and cities that have um, municipal or contracted services, uh, if it is paid for by inclusion in taxes, I have um, so that people aren't otherwise charged for it, like through uh, an enterprise fund, some problems uh, with understanding how it can possibly work in Massachusetts to go onto such a system because of Proposition 2, that if you're running at your pretty much where your tax rate can be, and you're trying to maintain services, then to add on an additional service of that size is a fairly significant expense. And uh, to be able to do it without um, going to voters for an override uh, in order to increase their taxes, uh, it just seems like it, it would be a difficult thing to do. So are you familiar with any Massachusetts communities that have made that switch in recent years? Honestly, no. Um, I might be able to direct you to my colleagues to see if they have any of that data. Um, but, and, and, I, and I recognize that trying to do an override is, you know, pretty difficult. But the difference in cost, you could show that the difference in cost per household um, of a contracted service would be a lot less than what they're already paying. I do recognize that a lot of time people just don't understand about taxes and they don't see like the dollar amounts they see, you know, in other words, they wouldn't be able to say equate in their heads particularly well, but okay, well, if I pay an extra 280 in my taxes, that's a lot better than the $500 I'm paying right now for my private subscription. But I think, you know, that's a way to present it to show, you know, that in the long run, you're saving because now you're not actually paying that 500 out of pocket. You're just giving it to the town. But I understand the difficulties with that. So, but I could try to um, contact my my colleagues and see if they know of any that have made the switch in recent years. Yeah, I mean, if somebody has, it would be helpful because then at least we have somebody to reach out to the um, municipal leadership in those communities because. Uh, I think that uh, the, it's the additional problem in that is trying to figure out what you're doing with um, rental properties and um, trying to sell it to people who are living in rental properties because um, they may not gain the benefit if, um, and you have to decide that you're gonna be picking up uh, their trash and you're gonna, somehow be able to show them that it's going to cause a reduction in their rent um, and uh, high degrees yeah. of skepticism in that one. Yeah, and that, that's really the, the, the um, property owner that it's on anyway, and you, you don't know what the rental agreement is. Most of these programs are done, the typical thing is one through four units, and then it's, you know, if they decide to expand into others, that's kind of later down the road. So it would probably be, um, I mean, it's, it's more common to have a contract where um, what the contractor picks up or one through four, you know, single duplex and three and four unit um, households. Yeah. But again, that's Honestly, something you could decide in the contract. I know though that's difficult to do. If you know of any communities or if when you're doing your research, the other question that would go with that is whether anybody knows of an enterprise fund arrangement where um, there's a required uh, payment for homeowners to go in, to pay into an enterprise fund, uh, which sort of segues to my next question, which is uh, if you do that kind of a system where people are paying through their taxes, um, you lose your incentive for people to use the uh, transfer station recycle center. So well, I don't know that it wouldn't have the effect of destroying that asset that the community has. Well, I can give you the example of South Hadley, which had it had has an enterprise fund, and 
in the fees that when the select board there, when the landfill closed and they knew they had to do something, they already had a transfer station. Um, and when the landfill closed, the select board decided that they would institute three fees and they did in, within, they already had an enterprise fund, institute three fees within, in, in, within the enterprise fund. Um, one was for the curbside, one was for your sticker to get in the transfer station. And now of course I'm blanking on what the third one was. And they were pretty clever about, oh, I guess, no, it wasn't the cost. Maybe it was the bags that people had to pay the bags. That might've been the third one, but just a cost. But anyway, um, and they were kind of clever about it because the first year when they still had money coming in from the landfill, they did this before it closed, all the fees were set to zero and they just sort of kind of but with that kind of program, you have to have an opt out because it's a separate, you know, um, it's a separate system and that legally you just have to have an opt out. So people, if they wanted to opt out of it, they had to prove to South Hadley that they had some other hauler they were paying, but then they couldn't use the transfer station because it was all linked as one program. So I guess that's the point I'm trying to get at is you could link them all together and then what people pay for gives them access to both the curbside and the transfer station. Okay, thank you. And there's one other question that I have, and uh, I guess I should tell you that I actually have some familiarity with some of these issues because uh, before we became a uh, city form of government and we're a town, Melissa and I were on the uh, select board so that, uh, and I was the select board liaison to the Refuse Recycling Management Committee, which uh, you referred to before. And um, I remember that committee doing a lot of uh, thinking about composting. And uh, one of the things that we ran into when we started looking at composting through that committee was that uh, there really weren't any major um, composters for Western Massachusetts. And it was hard to convince at that point, um, Amherst Trucking and uh, Dussault, who were the ones who were the, at that point, the trash haulers, they were willing to do it if there was a place that they could take it, but there wasn't any place to take it. Um, and I've talked, and I talked to um, our friends in Northampton and they were running into the same problem. Uh, when I looked at the list that um, Darcy provided in the packet that was a list of all of the recyclers that are being used by communities, there were none in the valley. Uh, they were all elsewhere. So I, uh, a little bit, um, wondering whether they still have that problem that we don't really have a um, solution to what I consider to be a major need unless somebody comes along and decides to be a major uh, composter for this region. Um, so Darcy, was that the map that from DEP yeah, that shows? I think okay. that <clears throat> the Valley uh, the facilities in the valley were on the third page. So there were there were a bunch of them listed, <clears throat> including Martins and there were- um, 360. Right, there was, um, um, uh, what's it called, Vanguard Recycling? Well, that uh, one's an, an anaerobic digester, but there's also, what's the one that's right in, in Northampton, the Valley Recycling or whatever, they accept compost as well. So, um, and, I, and I think, I mean, it's true, that's, you know, and it's this chicken and the egg. And I believe this is part of the reason why DEP is going, you know, has been promoting the, the food ban of one ton per week and now a half ton per week to help drive um, this so that there are more outlets. Um, but yeah, of course that has been a problem in the past, but I believe there's a capacity out there. Um, yeah. I think I think I think you would be able to find a place to take it, and USA will pick it up for you right now, if for an extra fee. So, George. Yeah, that's what they do for me. I mean, my trash every week is for three adults, is a small trash bag. Um, generally speaking, because everything else goes into that composting, and they come and pick it up every two weeks. Now, you're right, they do charge a fee, 
but I, you know, and that may be an issue going forward, but it certainly works. Do we have any other questions? <clears throat> Evan. Yeah, just, this was all really interesting and I, I look forward to the committee being able to talk about this further. Um, on pay as you throw, right? And we do sort of have some version of that with the transfer station, but not with curbside. Um, I'm always, you know, that's one of those things where you charge more money for something that we don't want to incentivize people to do less of the thing we don't want, um, which generally makes sense. But I, I know also sometimes there's equity concerns when it comes to low income households um, who maybe just naturally generate more trash because they're not bringing their, you know, canvas bags to Whole Foods. Um, so I guess I'm wondering if in any of the communities um, that that was incorporated or, or considered in some way of, of um, what do you do with lower income households um, who, who maybe um, that would impact negatively? I honestly did not see anything specific about that, but I can tell you that that is coming much more to the forefront um, everywhere now for good reason. As a matter of fact, uh, DEP's grants that came out this year, they have a whole list of what they call EJ, environmental justice communities that kind of get a break on um, applying for the money because of their demographics or whatever. Um, but that's certainly something that, you know, you, you can discuss and, and talk about. I don't know if you could do something like you do with, uh, what is it, 41Cs or whatever that, you know, sometimes you give a, a discount to certain seniors. I mean, that's all an internal discussion about how, how you want to structure it. But it's a good point. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, good point. Um, <clears throat> any other um, questions or thoughts? Um, I would just say that, you know, I've been working with zero waste Amherst and, um, you know, one of the one of the primary concerns they have is just um, we taking taking compost out of the trash stream because of the the re, the vast reduction in the trash, but the second piece of that is what you then do with the compost. You know where it goes. Is there any possibility of Amherst creating? a revenue generating compost facility. Um, what do you think about that, Guilford? Um, it's, it's possible. It, we, we would have to have some investment to get up and running, but you, as long as you're willing to invest the money into it, you could make a facility to do it. Yeah, I know the there's a regional um, group now between Amherst, Northampton, and Hadley, which actually Veronique facilitated getting it going. And uh, that whole group is going to take a field trip to Martin's Farm coming up sometime <laughs> in the near future. And that that's quite an operation. They have quite a, you know, they have some interesting equipment that they use to process the compost and then, then they sell it. So um, anyway, that, that's also uh, something that at least I'm interested in, you know, making sure that either our compost goes to someplace like Martin's Farm or, or we figure out how to compost here right in Amherst. Because if, we, if compost were included in basic service, we would be generating a huge amount more than we are now because it would be, all the households um, and the restaurants and so on. So we might, it might make sense to do something right here in Amherst. Andy, uh, and yeah, we should probably be uh, the just, comment. Just pointing out uh, to you, Darcy, that um, actually there is a facility locally that uh, Meadows University uh, right. does do its own composting. And I think that uh, they pull virtually everything from the dining halls and do their own composting, and use it for their own uh, gardens and uh, raise a lot of their own produce that they use in the dining halls. Yeah, no, that's fantastic. I'd also like to point out that when it comes to the businesses in town, 
there's a wonderful program through Recycling Works. I don't know if you've heard of them, but it's a program that's funded through DEP, but um, run by the Center for Ecotechnology. And they give free assistance to businesses and institutions for figuring out how to set up compost programs. The business or institution has to reach out to them, but if you advertise that, that you know, to, to your commercial entities in town, they could get free assistance with figuring out how to begin composting. I am going to move toward wrapping this up because we have another big topic coming up. Um, but um, if people don't object, I'm I'm kind of assuming that you know we this was our first presentation and discussion, and we'll um, maybe look forward to hearing more about it in July or August with and maybe getting some type of proposal <laughs> as yet un, un, uh, undetermined. Um, but I really want to thank uh, Veronique very much for um, giving us the presentation and looking into those nine communities and um, and hopefully we'll ha also have time to look at the summaries um, for each of the, the towns and look more at South Hadley which obviously you know has a has a system that we might want to look at okay. thank you yeah, thank Lennon. you Darcy, and, one other question quickly. What was the uh, story behind the Smith paper that was in the material? Oh, Smith, yes. I'm sorry, I didn't even mention it. Um, yeah, Zero Waste Amherst um, sort of facilitated Smith, a Smith capstone project. And they, the, they were some seniors at Smith that looked, that compared, um, uh, the current uh, system, the subscription system with the contracted out system. And it does have a lot about financials in there. I, th I highly recommend looking at it. Um, and uh, so it was, it didn't, it didn't look at municipally provided services. It just was comparing what we currently have with contracting out. Um, and, and ended up with a recommendation for contracting out. So, but yes, I please, please take a look at that. Um, we can't get them to present because they already graduated and left. Um, but wasn't yeah. it recorded? Did we have the recording for that? We do have the recording. We could, we could also share that, yes, um, if people are interested. So thank you. Thank you for mentioning that, Andy. Um, and Veronique was, was a part of that also. Um, okay, so we, uh, thank you, uh, Veronique. Um, we're thank gonna... you, if you don't mind, I'll bow out then if I'm, okay. <laughs> if I'm all good. Indeed. Alrighty, and um, you have my number, so if there are questions, just feel free. Okay, all right. Thank so, you. Thank you, right. so 728, we'll move to Mandy Jo, um, who's gonna present further on the surveillance technology bylaw. Thank you. Um, and thanks for having me. Pat could not be here tonight. Um, so it, you got me. Um, I just want to talk about a few things. It's been a while since we've been here and chatted about surveillance. Um, there's a couple of changes to the bylaw since the last time. Um, I think some of the changes that you saw last time are still marked as changes. I was just trying to remember, but again, it's been a couple months, so I'm not quite sure. The two changes I know are new. Um, so we did two things between the last time and this time. We reached out to some counselors in Cambridge and we heard back from one of them um, to try and get some answers to some of your questions and I'll go through that. And we also reached out to Paul um, and he re-looked at the bylaw and he gave us some um, concerns that we hopefully have addressed a little bit. And I'll talk first about the concerns that we tried to address in the bylaw, uh, Paul's concerns. And the first one is um, a change as I page through um, is one that is in section D, surveillance technology impact report and surveillance use policy submission. And he was looking at the um, what needs to be contained in the report. And one of the concerns 
he brought to us was the fiscal costs of the surveillance technology and that it's really hard to detail the personnel costs of something. And so he asked that we exclude the personnel costs that, you know, purchase costs, ongoing subscription costs, all of that's really easy to come up with, but personnel costs can be a lot harder. And so we've modified that section of the bylaw to exclude personnel costs as part of the impact report. And the other change from that he requested that we have agreed to is um, the, it's now not titled the annual surveillance report is now called a town department surveillance report because he asked that it not be required annually, um, that it be required only upon request by the town council uh, because it would require a lot of staff time to create yearly um, and wasn't sure, you know, I, I don't want to put words in his mouth, but wasn't sure whether the council would actually want it yearly. And so he asked that it be required only upon council request and that it be required no more often than 12 months. So we've changed that in section G to, to sort of go with that, that it's only upon request and therefore it didn't make sense to call it an annual surveillance report. So we made up a new name. Um, and so you'll see that name change throughout. I think all the other changes were there the last time you looked at the bylaw. Um, but if you have questions on those changes, I'm happy to discuss those. Um, to talk about some of the comments, you had a lot of questions about how Cambridge has, has dealt with this bylaw. Um, they've had it in effect now about two years, um, two and a half years or so. And so we, we reached out to a counselor um, I've been in contact with on other things and asked about how the approval process works, you know, the amount of staff time, um, whether the exigent circumstances exceptions and warrant exceptions have been used, um, and the usefulness of the annual surveillance report and any problems encountered. And so the response was that the approval process, each department would submit their own impact report to the council. Um, and that he, this counselor indicated that they range from very straightforward, um, things like uh, water meter readers, to not as straightforward like a shot spotter technology that the police department might be using. And that, so the more straightforward ones tend to sail through a council, the shot spotter ones, those a little more detailed ones get a lot more questions, but the counselor had no belief that any technology has ever been voted down. So, so this counselor believed Cambridge has approved every single technology brought in front of it, although various counselors have voted against any one technology. Um, counselor didn't know the staff time. Uh, the counselor referred us to someone at Cambridge. We never received a response from that person at Cambridge to the, you know, so the counselor we referred to the city manager's office and we reached out to them and we never received a response regarding staff time. Um, since uh, the counselor did suspect since some departments have a lot more technology than others that it would vary by department significantly. And Counselor was not aware of the police ever using the exigent circumstance exception or the warrant exception. Uh, at, at the time, it's only been in you know, effect for a couple of years, but they had no awareness of that. And in terms of the annual surveillance report, the counselor indicated that it's useful to get a sense of the scope of the surveillance technology in the city. And it gives the counselors chance to ask questions about the technology and how that technology is used, uh, citing specifically a use on school buses. Um, and what the counselor said specifically is that you get a lot of information in that report, so it can be tough to do all of the information justice. Um, and so it really just ends up focusing on one or two specific things. And the problems, any problems encountered after adoption of the oversight requirements and the counselor indicated the, niche, the issues they've noticed so far are just setting expectations for how much information is expected in the impact reports. Um, some departments are more thorough than others. And so, um, and as usual, counselors disagree on how much scrutiny anything needs to be done and how much information they really do want. And so that's more of the issues is just trying to set up a system where everyone's providing the same amount of information and the counselors are on board with what that is. The counselor did say when asked whether they believe it achieved the goals of protecting civil rights and liberties, uh, they believed it did. 
um, that it definitely gave an opportunity for the council to discuss the technologies um, and ask questions about how certain technologies are going to be used and um, before and so it provided a forum for those discussions, whereas prior to this ordinance, there weren't really any forums to discuss those matters. Um, so that's the information we got. I think that was to most of the questions you guys had asked last time. Um, so I'm happy to take any questions at this time. I have a question, Mandy Jo. Um, yeah. Just looking through the, the bylaw itself, um, section C1C um, said, says that the town manager may apply uh, an upgrade if necessary to mitigate threats to the town's environment, which I probably could have asked about the last time you were in front of us. Um, but I, I just wondered, if you could give me an example of what that means um, and what would be a threat to the town's environment? So I interpret that as mostly um, information technology, you know, where there's patches to computer systems um, that might be used in surveillance to stop external threats from being able to access the systems in the town. Um, so that that would be my example um, when I hear patch or upgrade, you know, where they the manufacturer has learned of a potential security flaw in the background programming and is trying to patch that programming. That security flaw could threaten access to the system. It could threaten use of the system. All of that. That that's how I read it. Uh huh. Okay, and so um, it also says that, that um, the town manager then um, could determine that the use was unavoidable. Mm -hmm. um, presumably because it was such a threat to the environment or something like that. Yeah, so, so you can Imagine a scenario where when um, face recognition technology or fingerprint technology first came out and and could be integrated into already existing systems that, um, you know, a computer technology firm would say, hey, you need to make this upgrade uh, to better protect your systems. And we'd never had surveillance, you know, fingerprint technology before, but it was that patch included other upgrades that also had vulnerabilities, but you couldn't separate the two patches. The upgrade to other vulnerabilities also included an upgrade to allow face recognition technology on there, say, um, on a computer. And the town department would be able to install that patch, even though it included a system, a technology that hasn't been approved because the other technology attached to it is necessary for the upgrade. And then potentially, if you couldn't shut off the face recognition technology after that patch has been made, that's where this um, determines the use is unavoidable. And then he still has to come to the town council um, because patches, you know, software patches generally contain a lot of different stuff, sometimes not just one thing, and you can't pick and choose always. Other questions or comments? Evan? Yeah, I have, I think, three questions, although two are related. And forgive me if these are questions that I've asked, because as you mentioned, it's been a while and I'm not as organized as you and cannot find my notes from the last meeting that we had about this. Um, so uh, the, the statement that the um, town manager would need to uh, have approval of a surveillance use policy um, prior to using new or existing surveillance technology for a purpose. So my interpretation of that is that if we pass this uh, next month, um, would that mean that the town manager, if there's any surveillance use technology that's already in existence and being used, would then need to very quickly 
submit to the council a whole bunch of surveillance reports before it, and, and would the use of that technology cease until he did that? And the related question to that is, if the answer is yes, is that a concern to the town manager? Is there any technology that we're already using that would fit into that? So existing, so I'm gonna explain because you're talking about B1B, the yeah. you know prior to engaging and using new or existing technology for a purpose or in a location not previously approved. So right. B, nothing's been approved. So. Yeah, no, so nothing's been approved, right? But assume something has been approved and and say it's, you know, say it's a, I don't know, some heat sensing thing or, or some camera and that camera is used on a certain location and they want to expand the location of use. You'd have to, before you expand the location of use potentially get approval. So that's what B is. There is, um, go down to um, it's F, section F is compliance for existing surveillance technology. And so that is the section that applies for if this passes everything that's currently in use right now. Um, and that is the, the town manager did talk about a concern about approval and timing because that's gonna be a lot of work initially. So this bylaw is written so that it does not become effective for 90 days after passage. So you get three months before it's even effective. And then F is the manager has 180 days to submit that request after that 90 days from the effective date, not from the passage date. So now we're at 270 days. The manager can request up to an additional 90 days on top of that, um, I believe is the way I did it, following the effective date. And so you've suddenly now got essentially a full year potentially to get those initial requests in. And in the meantime, those technologies, I believe we've written it so that they can still be used in the meantime. Um, you know, And then on top of that, if we haven't approved the policy within 180 days of him submitting his stuff, they're automatically approved. So it's a pocket approval, not a pocket veto. So there will be a, essentially from the date we vote, there'll be a full year for the manager to, uh, potentially up to a full year, nine months to 12 months to submit the applicable use policies for anything that's in use at the time we pass the bylaw. And, and I know the manager expressed concern initially with getting everything in. When we explained that timeline, he seemed to indicate that that, would probably be sufficient. I didn't get a direct answer from him. I Paul's on now, so he could probably give a direct answer, but that that all of those months in our emails seemed to be okay. But I welcome his response to that too. Yeah, I wasn't I wasn't sure because and you know, again, forgive me because also as you are aware, this bylaw is dense and so it's easy to read over something. I hadn't seen in F anything it, that made it explicit that during that 180 day or one year period, the technology could continue to be used, but perhaps I just read over it, which is very likely. Um, and, and then my, my second or third question, depending on how you measure this, is um, either for you or Paul, which is you, you, would acknowledge, you had pointed out two changes that you had made to this bylaw uh, at the request of, of the town manager. Uh, but you used the phrase that, that you and Pat had agreed to. And so I guess I'm curious, are there other changes that were requested that you did not agree to? I don't think so other than that timing issue. I know he had mentioned that as a concern and we just went back with a description of what the timing was without changing any of the timing. But I think everything else Paul pointed out, um, we addressed. That's all I have, thank you. Andy? You're mute. Uh, You're still muted, Andy. <laughs> you hit it twice. Got it now. <laughs> uh, I guess that I still have some of the same concerns that I had before because uh, 
if we're going to recommend to the council something of this complexity, then in, um, the council is then going to expect it of our staff. We really have to have a threshold of what it is that we expect um, to be able to show, to justify it to the community, through the council and, and generally, and to our staff. And um, has there been a series of complaints um, or uh, actual incidents that people are concerned about? Or is this operating out of fear and just seems like the right thing to do? So I can't answer the complaints issue because that would be within town hall. Um, I wouldn't say it's operating out of fear. Um, my original reason for proposing this is an operating out of a desire for absolute transparency on things that track people. Um, and, you know, Councillor Brewer forwarded to myself and Pat a newspaper article from, I think it was Eastern Massachusetts, um, that talked about a police department that started using drones to track and view into backyards and track suspects through the sky and that the town did not and the residents did not know of that use at all for I think it was nearly a year. Um, that concerns me that 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 could happen in Amherst. And I don't want that to happen in Amherst. I think if we're going to start using things that track people, um, however, for whatever good reason we think they might be there, the town should know about it. The people should know about it. Um, and so that's that's the basis behind that. It's not that they might get misused per se. I'm not. I'm not. I have not proposed this because I'm concerned that any technology that's out there that might be being used now is being misused. Although there's always that concern when no one knows what even technology we've got that tracks people. Um, it's more of a concern that we should know what technology is. And I think the year or so that we've been discussing this in TSO, when we've asked about what technology is out there that would fall under this. Even Paul's had a hard time describing what would fall under this, which means we don't really know what technology this town has that is actually tracking people or could be used to track people. And that concerns me. If someone asks, hey, am I being tracked when I go into town hall? What are you doing with all those cameras? No one has an answer to that. And that concerns me. And so this bylaw is meant to at least bring out into the open what technology is out there that could actually track people and their daily lives. Shouldn't we start with that inquiry and do a department by department viewing of what it is that's out there to see if we have a problem before we start regulating a problem that may or may not exist? So that was the question that was asked last meeting. And Pat and I um, spoke to Paul and had a meeting with Paul shortly after that meeting. And um, I'm trying to find that, that meeting, but um, at that point, we had agreed that Paul would take three months to um, provide a subset of information set forth as requirements for inclusion in the annual surveillance report, and that the information that would be provided would be sections G or A, C, and F on the attached bylaw. Um, and when Paul got back to us after three months, what we got back was concerns about the invent initial inventory requests and permissions and the annual report and the concerns that I just said. So you had asked for that information. We had asked Paul to work on a subset of that. And what I've told you is what we got back regarding that subset. So I, I don't feel we as sponsors can do any more than ask the town manager at the behest of TSO to provide that information. Um, and it's up to the town manager to follow through with that request or not. And um, 
at this point, I guess my feeling would be unless this bylaw passes, we will not get that information. I guess uh, Paul has a choice as to whether he wants to raise his hand and respond. Uh, the other thing that I remember from our last discussion of this was that it seemed like there was a little bit of a quandary because the people who were very concerned about policing and wanted body cameras were looking for expansion of technology as we're sitting here talking about something to limit technology. And it strikes me that um, that creates a little bit of a conflict. So I will continue to maintain that this is not necessarily a means of completely limiting technology. It is a means of letting the public know what technology is out there and who can have access to it and when. And so it would not limit the ability of body cameras to be used. Yes, the council would have to approve that use because that type of technology would fall under this bylaw, um, but it is not an automatic no. It's up to the council to decide whether the um, proposed use and all of the um, safeguards surrounding that use regarding access and use and everything are appropriate. Um, as, as the counselor in Cambridge said, nothing, they've got shot spotter technology. Um, they, they, they probably, I don't know whether they've got body cams too, but they haven't not approved any use at this point. It's more of a transparency that we seem to not be able to get in Amherst, even with this proposed bylaw having been proposed. Paul? Yes, so I appreciate the counselors, uh, D'Angelo and Haneke, bringing the, the bylaw and we reviewed it with staff and we made comments on the bylaw. Um, you know, I think what would be useful, I think what Ms. Counselor Steinberg is talking about is, you know, well, what is in the universe of, of this bylaw? And, um, or whether it's a good bylaw, that was, those were not questions that were posed. And so, but I think, you know, I, I did raise in my comments to the counselors some concern like and it just sort of basic questions and i think it might be a, a good exercise for us to provide you um you know for instance um we now have electric charging stations that collect data is that something that are on town property and is that something that we would need to go to the owner of and report and just sort of basic questions like is that what you're talking about or not and so um and I'm just looking through the other comments. So I think that type of thing, if um, maybe that's the next step for the um, TSO committee is like, well, what are the level of technologies that could be um, um, addressed by this bylaw? Because it, it just, it does change. Things are always adjusting um, and what, and maybe do a quick inventory for, um, for the council. So if I may respond, with all due respect, three months ago, um, you agreed to do that inventory, Paul, and it was not produced in the three months it was agreed to be done on. Um, and so, you know, I mean, that was March 3rd. Um, we're now almost in July, G4, A, C, and F. A, C, and F are a description of how the technology has been used, a summary of the complaints, and statistics related to any public records request, and none of that information has been provided despite you agreeing to do so within three months, and it's been three and a half now. Evan? Yeah, so, uh, you know, the, the fun thing that we've been doing as part of this discussion is just like throwing out random pieces of technology and wondering if that um, qualifies, which is um, a, a useful activity. So, of course, whenever we do that, I always go back to the definition listed in the bylaw. And so um, Paul's example of electric charging stations, I don't think would qualify because it is not um, collecting information capable of being associated with any individual. But then I also noticed that the definition says individual or group. And so I guess I, I'm just curious just from Mandy, 
really quick when you were thinking group do you mean demographic group political like what, what I, first i've always had in my head that it's it, information about a specific ident the information has to be identifying information about an individual to qualify but now i'm wondering if maybe that's not the case based on the addition of group so to address the parking one there are you got to also look at b right i, I did whatever b and you could argue that parking access and revenue control systems, well, that's not the charger. I mean, depending on how you think of it, the chargers are at parking lots where you're paying to park too. Um, but um, yeah, to answer the other question, I'm trying to go back to it. Um, designed or primarily intended to do so. Um, so you gotta go to back to designed and or primarily intended to collect information specifically associated with individual or group. So group, you know, we pulled that definition from probably Cambridge um, or the ACLU. And so I, I guess group probably is more to go with an individual as one person, um, a company is not. You know, and so I, I would say on an initial response that group is meant to capture not just, you know, to capture potentially um, companies, you know, tracking of non-individuals. Um, but you could also say, you know what, um, sometimes those drones are bought in order to monitor protests and protests, political protests with groups is a group designed to specifically track information of a group. That group is a group of certain political ideology, if that's what you're trying to use that technology for. Alyssa? So I apologize for not finding my men, my notes from the last meeting until Mandy Jo pegged me to a date. And it really was way back on February 25th when we talked about how it was that we could get this information, basically much the equivalent, not exactly equivalent of what was for a few minutes, an annual report, but do it now because it was going to be useful information that also informed the budget. And so that was back at the TSO meeting of February 25th. And um, Evan wondered why I, what my rationale was for asking for it. And, you know, we went back and forth and basically I thought the gist was, and what Mandy Jo expressed earlier is this isn't a matter of saying, well, what parameters does the town council want to put on this or what does TSO want to put on this? We already said what we wanted. We didn't get what we wanted. So, and it didn't inform the budget this year. So where are we now? Because I don't want to sit down and say, well, the parking pay by space machines, yes, the electric chargers, no. I just want to know what you think meets the parameters of the bylaw because that's the data we think is important to have. And I said then, and I'll say again now, if that's the data that's important to have, then we should attempt to put it together now. And that would be informative as to whether or not we're defining it correctly. But I, we're, we're having a chicken egg discussion now that doesn't make sense to me given the conversation we had back in February. And and we attempted to work that out with the manager. Um, yeah. And you know, from a sponsor point of view, yeah. I, I guess I would just say I'm tired of waiting. We had an agreement, it didn't happen. And I'd ask TSO to just move forward with this, recognizing that it may not happen unless this bylaw is passed. Andy? So I um, guess uh, I'm a little bit cautious about um, putting too much pressure on uh, Paul and other administrative staff in the last period between February and now and pretend that nothing has happened like uh, major litigation over the library, continued pandemic, uh, development of uh, 
the budget, um, all of the work that's been going on because of that with uh, the police department and the community responder program. So um, I do think we need to be reasonable people as we do this. And I'm not sure that criticizing that something hasn't been done since February 25th, when so much has happened since February 25th, uh, is really unfair. And we have a duty to be fair. Uh, so I'm, I'm concerned about you saying that. The second thing is that I'm all, we keep coming back to, but Cambridge did it, but Cambridge did it. I am sort of tired of Cambridge comparison because that was uh, what was thrown out by the percent for art people and lots of other folks, but Cambridge did it though when it came to um, participatory budgeting, but Cambridge did it. Cambridge is not a comparable community. It is so wealthy. It has such low taxes and high revenue and has uh, the ability to do something that other communities can't do effectively, which is a differential tax rate between commercial and uh, residential um, so that they have this huge budget without burdening their taxpayers. So I don't find that always going, but Cambridge did it makes for a good thing. And I sort of get grumbly about that after a while, fairly obviously, because I've just heard it about three different projects now. And uh, the last thing is an entirely different thing. And that is that uh, uh, the Parkmobile, uh, we really need to understand that technology fairly quickly to understand, to know whether our staff has access to the data on an ongoing basis about who parks where and how frequently, because if you're gonna say, the availability of data that can be misused, um, that's fairly high on the list if you're going to go that route. Uh, so uh, those are just uh, three quick comments. And I'd like to respond quickly as the um, item about the data that was requested that we sought to get an agreement with the manager for when we sat down with the manager in early March, the manager originally proposed a one month response time. And I responded and said, that seems very quick. Let's put three months on it. So we actually extended the time frame beyond what the manager originally wanted to have as the response. And we've been waiting patiently for three months and we did not receive it. As for Cambridge, I absolutely agree with you. We are not equivalent to Cambridge. I did not do this and propose this because Cambridge has it. I did it because I believe we need it. And this committee has asked for comparative data and the only town city in the Commonwealth that we can compare to when asking about how this actually works in implementation is Cambridge. So that's why I keep bringing up Cambridge, not because we need to follow their lead, but because when asked, how does it work other places, Cambridge is our only comparison right now. But I did this not even, I'm not even sure I realized when I officially originally thought about proposing this that Cambridge had adopted it. Thank you. Um, Evan. Yeah, so um, I guess this is a question for our committee. So we have been talking about this for a very long, I think since last summer. Um, it's changed quite a bit between the first time we saw it and now, but my assumption is it's not going to change very much further, if at all. And so I guess to me, we're at a point where we did ask for some information. We haven't received that information. The sponsor has asked us to move forward without it. And so we're at a decision point of, do we want to continue waiting and asking for that information and hold off on a recommendation back to the council until we have that? Or do we feel as though we're nearing the point that not necessarily this meeting, but perhaps in the next meeting or so forth of making a recommendation? So that's more of a question for the committee, but I'm, I'm trying to, which I think is what Alyssa was also getting at in her last statement of, so what is our next step? We didn't get the information we wanted. Are, do we keep waiting? Do we, make the recommendation, but where are we at as a committee? That makes sense for us to talk about that. Um, I just would like to make one comment since I haven't said anything yet. Um, 
and that is, you know, it, it, I believe that that Mandy, Joe, and Pat have come back at least three times, um, and each time they um, had made amendments to the bylaw and and have accommodated different requests uh, that the town manager has has asked for, and has really changed the bylaw quite a bit to make it more accommodating in general for the town, easier, less administrative burden. Um, and, you know, I, I, I personally am, am ready to act on it, um, especially if we don't think that we're gonna get those answers. Um, so, you know, I feel like it's, um, you know, looking at Cambridge, uh, where the, you know, the, the Cambridge City Council uh, approved all the different uses. And I said to myself, well, you know, if they approve them all, then why are we even doing this? Um, but to me, it's, it's preventative. It's like just the fact that the, the bylaw exists will, make the town manager and department heads and so on think about what kind of tech technology they're, they're moving toward. And so I think that there's a great value in having it um, regardless. And it, you know, it may be that the technologies that we get will be approved, but at least we'll know what's going on um, and we'll have it, that check uh, where the town manager and the department heads know that this is what they'll have to go through if they ask for such and such a technology. Alyssa? Yeah, I appreciate trying to get to, you know, where are we going with this? And, you know, obviously everyone knows I'm fierce and we asked for things. I asked for things. I got agreement that others asked for things that I thought the co-sponsors should have brought to us in the first place. And I was frustrated then. I'm like, why don't you heard from Cambridge? Why don't you have more information about what you're already doing? And they went off and they obtained that information to the best that they possibly could because there's only so much control that they have over things. I was holding on to this in TSO because I wanted us to be able to explain it fully to the counselors who hadn't heard their multiple presentations and seen how it had evolved over time. Because right, intent versus words on paper can be hard to communicate sometimes. It is a new Massachusetts thing, just even though it's a huge thing in many places. And so I wanted to hold on to it till I felt like, hey, we can make a really solid case for what's going on here. And I thought we needed that other information for that to be clear to the other counselors as well as to myself to support it rather than it being what one might argue i'm hearing from some members that maybe it's a cons this is a, a solution in search of a problem and i don't think that's true i think that there are serious concerns about not knowing how data is being used so given that i complained i got my complaint addressed to the best of the ability of the people involved now I can't insist any further that they go back and get more data. I'm not hearing that the town manager saying, oh yeah, now I suddenly have time to do this. So I guess I'm feeling like it's time for TSO to move it to town council. And in all reality, it's gonna be in the town manager's court to explain why this is a horrible idea because we don't have anything other than that from him to really say why it's a bad idea. So it's not the kind of adversarial position I wanted to be on on this bylaw, but I think it's where we've ended up. And yes, there are lots of reasons, lots of things have gotten complicated over the past year, obviously, but there's also process and we can't hold on to things forever because someday we might do something different. So I do think that TSO should now feel like having had multiple presentations, asked for information, gotten more information as we requested, couldn't get the other information through no fault of their own. I think that it is time for us to make a recommendation and then let the town council sort it out. I'm just sorry that we couldn't provide better backing to the sponsors to ensure that there was a more complete package for when it goes to town council. But I think that there's only so much two part-time counselors can do to make that information happen. And I think they've done it. 
you. I just want to let you know that there's some possibility that my my computer will lose charge, and if I disappear, you'll know why. Um, but um, uh, anyway, just wanted to let you know that, Paul. Thank you. So, you know me, and I'm not being obstinate of this. I responded to the sponsors um, with the track changes comments on the bylaw, and that's what I thought I was supposed to do. And if I miss something that people wanted, you know, I apologize for that. This is not the, you know, um, it feels like to me that if it was like, you know, hey, you forgot to give us this piece of it. And maybe that's not on the sponsors to 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 um, you know remind me of something like that um, you know so and, and just so you know it's not you know I'm holding on on this information because I don't want to give it to you or something like that that's not the way I work you know I think I I try to provide the information the council needs to make an informed decision um, I I didn't have it in my brain um, that. I was supposed to produce a list and maybe I just missed that or I just, I just, I had in my brain that we were supposed to revise the by, look at the bylaw. How is it impacting the, how would it operate, impact the operations of our departments? That's what my estimate department has to look at. I did not ask them for a list of uh, things that could be applied to this. Um, so, you know, I don't think anybody has an objection to the bylaw. So if you want to move forward on it, that's, that's, that's up to the council, obviously. Um, but I, it, it, I just want to identify that this is sort of an awkward conversation to have with a committee where it feels like I'm being placed in a position that implies that um, I'm purposely withholding information from the council, which is not what I do. And, um, you know, um, so, and uh, I, I may, I've obviously done it in the council's eyes because I haven't given you the information, but it's not purposeful. Um, and if anything, it's an oversight. So, um, so I just wanted to say that it, it just, it seems that this, this to me was an awkward cover is, is an awkward conversation because it seemed to be set up as a, um, a, a confrontation that could just didn't need to be. Any other thoughts about going forward? Evan. So as Alyssa pointed out, when we were uh, talking about this back in February and she asked for that information, um, I said, I don't want that information, nor do I care about it. And it's not going to alter how I vote on this. And so I'm not waiting for that information personally because I never wanted it in the, in the first place. So I would be perfectly fine with us going forward. Um, Andy. I guess I would feel uncomfortable voting tonight. Um, I think that the reasonable thing to do is to commit to a meeting date at which we are going to, going to vote that it be within a reasonable period of time, and I'm going to leave it to the group to define, to decide the definition of that. And then if additional information becomes available and it uh, is a, you know, affects people how they vote in the, when the committee gets to that date, that's uh, fine, but it probably is worth setting a timeline for when we're going to do it and move forward. But I think it would be very difficult. I would be very uncomfortable doing it tonight. Do I, do I um, sense that there are three of us that are wanting to move it forward tonight? Uh, Evan? Just to clarify, I don't feel like it necessarily has to be tonight. If Andy feels uncomfortable and wants to wait until next meeting, I have no issue with that. Uh, my point was just to say, I would like us to move forward even in the absence of that information that we asked for, whether that's tonight, next meeting, the following meeting doesn't matter so much to me as I don't wanna wait for any more information. Alyssa? Yeah, I too am done waiting for information. So I don't know what Andy's waiting for. And, and, and again, I'm not trying to be confrontational here, Andy. 
I just don't know. I don't think there's any reason to believe we're going to get any more information at this particular moment, given everything else that's going on. So I don't see a need for a pause, but if there's, if you're actually, I mean, you said if additional information comes, it's not going to become available. So I'm okay with moving it forward, but of course we haven't heard from George either. So I don't know. George. Well, I'm echoing, I think, Alyssa's question. Um, I'm, at this point, I don't know what more we're waiting for, and it's not clear. Um, and so without that, and with Evan's comment that he doesn't really matter whether information comes forward or not, he's ready to move ahead. And there's no clear sense of what it is we're waiting for. I think we might as well go ahead and act. Unless someone can make an argument for something that we desperately need, and also convince me that there's a reasonable chance that that information can be provided uh, in the next two weeks. Um, the sponsors have waited a long time. Um, so I think we should go ahead unless someone can make a case. Yeah, I would agree with that. Would someone like to make a motion? I move we um, recommend the town council adopt the, Mandy Joe. would you like to fill in the blank? It's the surveillance technology oversight bylaw. Someone like to second? I can second. Any further discussion? Evan. Yeah, I just want to say, so I, I'm not 100% sold on the necessity of this bylaw, and I've expressed that to Mandy before, um, but my primary concern has always been the burden placed on staff. Uh, it seems this most recent revision really did take into account trying to reduce that burden, um, especially I had a huge concern about the annual report, but it seems that they have addressed that. So um, last meeting when I said, I don't need any more information, it's not gonna change my vote. It wasn't gonna change my no vote, um, but actually given the revisions that came forward um, that reduce some of that burden on staff, I am gonna support the, the motion to recommend adoption. George. And we have given Paul ample opportunity this evening to express uh, any serious concerns he has about burden on staff or uh, objections that his department has have for the bylaw. And if I understand him, and I think he was pretty clear, there are none. So um, I too do not share the sense of urgency for this, um, but I understand the argument to be made that it's important that people know. Um, I don't think there's a problem. I don't think there will be a problem, but um, the point that the sponsor Mandy made is that um, this is also a vehicle for ensuring that people know what's happening with this kind of information. So with that argument um, and with what I understand to be Paul's uh, statement that there are no serious objections from staff uh, and he has no serious objections, so it will require some staff time. Um, steps have been taken in this latest version to reduce that. Um, I'm willing to vote in favor of this. Andy. Maybe it's because I joined the, I'm the newbie on the committee. And so this is only the second discussion for me of this bylaw. And you guys are in the third discussion of the bylaw. And so I'll admit that that um, may be a factor here because I'm sort of feeling like, yeah, I'll be ready if uh, we get one more opportunity to get at least for ourselves and for the council um, a more comprehensive listing of what is already in use and so that we get a sense of what it is that uh, we're, we're asking and what, what a sense is of what is out there that we should be concerned about. Um, so I, I, if we do go ahead and vote tonight, I may be inclined to vote no, I probably will be. And it's not so much on the end as to whether I could be convinced that it's the right bylaw, but I just, uh, 
not quite there yet. And uh, so it's a timing issue uh, that, that I uh, think that necessarily is a bad idea. I just not convinced yet that it's a good idea. And then you get to the burden of proof. Any other comments? Okay, let's vote. Um, I vote yes, Evan. Aye. Uh, George? Aye. Andy? No. Melissa? Aye. Okay, so we're recommending it four to one. And I don't know whether that's something that will be taken up on Monday. Probably won't be, right? No. Because it, it needs up. to go to GOL now for attorney review. So. Oh, okay. So, all right. Good. All bylaws have to go through GOL. So I, I, I can take the, I can clean up the track changes version and send it on to George as chair of GOL. Okay. And I don't have to write a report by Monday. Yay. Um, okay. <laughs> um, all right. So thank you. Great. Thank you, Mandy Joe. Um, so, all right. Now we're moving on to our hopefully brief discussion of the formatting for our for format going forward for our meetings and whether or not people want to stay with the Zoom format or in person. Any discussion about that? Two of us are, um, you know, I, I believe, Alyssa, I'm speaking for you, Alyssa and me, um, I think that we would need to be uh, participating remotely if we go forward in person. At least I, I will need to be. So um, just want to let you know that. George? You will uh, no doubt discover this when you read the uh, GOL report for this Monday's meeting. But we discussed this at GOL and, and that committee, three members uh, very much wanted to return to in-person. But through the course of the discussion, um, it was clear, I think, to all of us that, that if we insisted on that, we could have passed it. Um, it would really create a, a, an unfortunate dynamic uh, where people who, for good reason, couldn't be present um, would then be uh, potentially handicapped. It would just, so we came to the agreement uh, by consensus that we would um, go back to Zoom, though we've had two meetings now of GOL in person and they, they went fine, but the, the dynamic is not, I think, ideal and it puts people in awkward situations. So uh, here I'm going to, based on that experience, I'm going to argue that we should continue with Zoom um, as we have been doing and perhaps choose a date in September to revisit it, even though I personally, both on the council level and on the committee level, very much personally prefer in-person meetings. I think it just, uh, to insist on that would just create an, an unpleasant or unfortunate dynamic and make it harder for us to do our job. So I think we should go to Zoom, keep to Zoom. Evan and Andy, do you have thoughts? I'm completely, ambivalent on this, I don't really care. But I do know we don't have the option of hybrid meetings. Um, and so CRC on Tuesday did a meeting in which one member participated remotely. Um, it went fine, um, but, I, but I had forgotten what it's like to have remote participation where you can't actually see the person and they can't see screens. And I did recognize that it's difficult. So I think if there, if there are members on this committee that absolutely will not show up to a meeting in person, I think it's better for us to just keep it on Zoom. How about you, Andy? I think they're pretty much where Evan is at. Uh, I also, uh, uh, for some committees, though not for this one, because we today have two people in the audience uh, but uh, that's the other thing is just so that I find that uh, the remote meetings certainly are kinder to 
uh, people from the community who want to either observe or participate in meetings. Um, George, you have another comment? Just quickly, if you will, um, I just would ask that we set a date for uh, where we come back to reconsider. That's the only request I would make. Uh, it sounds like we have a consensus to go forward on Zoom. Do you want to just say to the first meeting date in September? That's what we did in GOL. Um, is people good with that? And then we can we can revisit it then. Um, okay, great. Um, now we have our our June fourteen minutes. Um, anyone have any problems with them <laughs> i would make i would make a motion to accept the minutes um, as presented second no discussion um okay Alyssa. stain darcy yes evan aye george aye andy aye Okay. Um, uh, the next meeting agenda, unclear. <laughs> we may have some public way requests. Uh, Paul, does it look like we are going to get some potential referrals? Yes, yeah, so the, um, I'm just trying to line up your um, meeting with the potential recreation director appointment, which is a 14 day turnaround. Um, and if I'm looking at, we we're, we've, are in the final round of interviews um, and they go through next week. Um, just look at the calendar. I think our last interview is on July 2nd. Um, so if we are shooting for the, um, July 12th council meeting. I haven't really done the calendar on this yet, but that's the, that's the thing. That's the, that would be a time sensitive item. Everything else would not be time sensitive. Okay. Um, George, do you have any idea about the residential parking issue coming forward? Uh, I'm that's still in Guilford's uh, court. And so I'm waiting for Guilford to get back to me. And I, I'm not going to put too much pressure on him right now. Um, he's aware of it. Um, so right now, I'd say unlikely. Um, so unclear what's coming up next, um, other than what Paul was just talking about. Your next uh, meeting is July 8th? I have July 15th. No, I have the so first. Really? OK, that was my question. When are we meeting next? <laughs> and, and could we get a schedule? Maybe Pick a date. A schedule. No, I, I'm serious. I have a schedule that I follow rigorously on GOL, and there maybe is one, and I've just lost it, but I don't have one, and it would be nice yeah. to know. I, it's so my phone says the 15th, and my phone says the first wrong. and the 15th. Ah, okay. Thank you. July 15th. I apologize. Um, ah, my phone says the first as well. Thank you, Alyssa. Yeah. <laughs> Then there's a three week gap in the in the July and August meetings. Um, so um, can, I, can I ask a question about the Darcy? Yeah, Alyssa. So my schedule does say the first and the 15th of July, right? Mm -hmm. That's correct. And so the first would meet Paul's requirement in order to get it to the town council for the July meeting, right? Uh, I'm not sure we're finished. I have to check when we are finishing our interviews for that. Because then the other option obviously would be you would ask us to have a separate meeting just about right. this one issue. But normally we're meeting the first and the 15th. And so when we're talking about next agenda, we're talking about the first. While we're talking about calendar issues, and George really tried, but didn't get an answer as to what date we would revisit this. And since we're a little unsure on our calendars right now, I believe that September 16th is our first September meeting, as Darcy referenced, our first September meeting. Unfortunately, September 16th is also the second evening of Yom Kippur, which doesn't end until after, you know, it's until sunset. 
So I don't know why we have a meeting scheduled for the 16th in the first place, but that is our first September meeting in terms of revisiting the meeting format discussion. So I think we have to look at that because that's not usually when towns meet. And the other item is then if the first isn't going to work for you, Paul, which seems quite likely given that it's literally next week, it won't um, work, yeah. that we'll have to have a meeting prior to the TSO scheduled meeting of the 15th. So maybe do we change the July 1st meeting, Darcy, to a different date that's somewhere between then and the town council meeting that's on the, Evan, when's the town council meeting? The 16th? No, the town council's 12th. meeting's on the 12th. 12th of July, yeah, 12th yeah. of July. Yeah, town council meeting's on the 12th. So if we can somehow, right, so that puts us why meeting meet the on, week of the fifth somehow. Why don't we meet on the eighth? If we stay the same day, just meet on the eighth. Are you available on the eighth? Well, it's a Thursday. July eighth. What else do I do on a Thursday? Some of us might do something on the other Thursday. I, it's hard for me. I to know. Do Imagine that. So like, anyway, that's a suggestion. So, so there's there's if Thursday the eighth works for everybody, then I would think we could meet then instead of on the first, and then we'd also meet on the fifteenth, unless of course we ran out of things to do. Right. Um, that is fine with me. Um, why don't we? Uh, why don't but we that's three. Uh, that is three weeks in a row. So, uh, right, 1st, 8th, and 15th. Maybe we knock off the 15th. We're knocking off the 1st. Ah, yeah. thank you. You're right. So we're I'm knocking sorry. off the 1st because that's right. just next week. Exactly. Thank you. And then we'll meet the 8th so that we get Paul's recommendation and we can turn it around to the council for the council meeting that's on the 12th. Yeah, thank you. All right. That's right. Yeah. Right. We are, you know, we are going to meet two weeks in a row and then skip three weeks right. we might you think that you would rather keep it that way well we can adjust i mean as, as Alyssa said if some things come up we can certainly adjust uh, i have no problems with not meeting for three weeks but there may be things that come along and then we can change but um this works right. eighth and so 15th. we'll we'll assume july 8th and 15th um and then we'll check on the 16th of september to maybe night need it sounds like we need to shift that meeting to a different September date. And then that will be the first meeting in September where we talk about what our meeting format is. Can we do that right now? Um, either the 9th or the uh, 9th would be an, a date of September, Thursday. Um, What's the previous meeting? Okay. I'm just don't, yeah. Sorry. I'm going to get my list. So we have, we have August 26th and then September 16th. Thank so you. We, we could meet on the 9th. Um, people prefer that. And then we don't have another meeting until the 30th. Okay. I think that makes sense because September is literally full of Jewish holiday observances, but Yom Kippur is the most, as I understand it, the most serious one on the 16th in terms of work requirements, et cetera. And so the ninth is a less critical holiday. The 23rd is part of a long stretch of holiday. So I think ninth is the most right. logical choice. The town council meeting is September 13th. So um, hopefully we won't need a report. The night actually is not a holiday, is it? Isn't uh, Rosh Hashanah over at 5 p.m. on the day before the 8th? Yeah, I always check like three different calendars, so I'm not relying on my phone for that one. So if you know the answer to that one already, Andy, then we're fine. But if, so the night should be fine. But, but I think it's some of that always depended upon the degree of observance of the person who's being asked the question, which is why I always beg out of being the one who can ask. Who's asked him all that question, therefore? Yeah, but 16th is definitely out. 
and that's why it's not actually going to be the black party that night so yeah no. are we good good with our schedule paul just to clarify so you're meeting on july 8th which i appreciate because that will make the timing work for the the department head appointment then you've got the 15th august 26th september 6 september 9th and september 30th just one note on september 9th that is likely to be the bid block party that's what they're going to change it to no. yeah. yeah well that's bad then we, we shouldn't do that and also we we're meeting on august 5th paul august 5th um yes um so well, given that we're meeting at the end of August, right? We're meeting on the 26th. I don't think it's the end of the world if we don't meet till September 30th. So is the rule on September 16th that after? After sunset would be all right, but it's not sunset till like 7.15 that night. Oh, you looked it up? Yeah, when the bid block party was inadvertently scheduled for that date, I did look it up, yes. <laughs> I mean, what we could do is just change it to 7.30 that night. Um, it, Yom Kippur is a serious enough holiday that I think that expecting people to, that's like saying, yeah, I don't know, it makes me uneasy. I mean, we could pick a different day of the week, that, that particular week, right, in theory, but it wouldn't be Wednesday, and so... Do we just say, well, that we don't meet in September other than the 30th unless something comes up? We could do that. I mean, because we also, if something does come up, we have the ability to schedule a special one-off meeting like we did on that Monday meeting. Right, that worked out. Right. And we do have two meetings in August. Yes, we could always so. meet the 23rd if we needed to um well except for it being midway through sukkah but that's a different question <laughs> so like i said september is just chock full this year and so i i think it makes the most sense to assume that the 30th that you scheduled forever ago is for sure ago but that there's no other september meeting unless we add one in and we pay attention to all those holidays before we add it in Okay, well, we, we, can, we can discuss it further. We got plenty of time. Um, but, um, but we know that we're going to meet on July 8th instead of July 1st. Um, okay, we have some public still. No, we don't have public still here. That, no, let's see, do we? And Tracy has her hand up. Um, Okay, now, am I in charge of bringing Tracy in? Because that might not be good. Um, let's see. Here we go. Tracy. There she is. Hi, Tracy. Hi. Hi. <laughs> see you. Hi. Am I the only <laughs> member of the public, I guess? You are. You're the only member. <laughs> Art was there for quite a while. but Oh, there you go. At least I appreciate that I can participate remotely. <laughs> um, and I often walk around during the meetings, too. Um, so I just had a brief uh, comment. It was related, actually, to the earlier presentation about solid waste hauling and options in Amherst. Um, so... This isn't an issue I've thought a ton about. You know, I've been, I was always pretty happy with Amherst Trucking, which I've been an Amherst resident for 20 years. I've had Amherst Trucking. My rates haven't ever increased a lot. But like after USA, as documented a little bit in the Smith report, after uh, USA recycling took over, the rates went up. My rate only went up about 10%, not a big deal for over 10 years. Um, but I know some people said their rates increased like 50 to 75% or more. So after I had read that, um, I did reach out to USA Recycling about it. Um, uh, since they are the major like hauler still in Amherst. And unfortunately, they really do have an issue with transparency with their rates. 
Um, so I received an email back from their director of operations that said that we don't post our rates on our website for a number of reasons, but most importantly, because trash is personal. And we see value making sure that the services are personalized for each customer. So, I mean, I think that some people, they're really, it really would benefit from more transparency. You know, I really was not comfortable with that response. I did eventually talk to a customer service person at USA uh, and they did give me the rundown of all the rates. But, um, you know, you really had to look for that information to get that response from the director of operations. I know that the decision about the contracts, you know, with USA is not made at the TSO level. I think it's made by the Board of Health, like that does the licensing, but, you know, it is concerning. And I think there is a lot of kind of misinformation out there. Not everybody will read the Smith report, which looks great and is super informative. So, you know, if there could be some transparency, I think that would be a huge help. Um, because one of the things too, I had heard that like Dassault had a practice where were people with long driveways that they would go down the driveway and, you know, pick up the trash. And so when USA took over, they continued to offer that, but it was like at a premium cost. And they didn't tell people if you take your, if you take your trash containers, recycling containers out to the curb, you know, that would save you, you know, 25, 30, 50%. Um, and so when people found that out, they said, oh, wait, I could save all that money and I never knew, right? So, I mean, that's one of the issues with having almost a monopoly. So, I mean, Republic has come to Amherst, but most of the people still use USA. I mean, the other thing too is just, you know, I think there is a lot of value in looking at ways to cut the waste and the current pricing structure of these commercial haulers is not really aimed at doing that. Like for example, I think if you have like one trash barrel, but then you get a second, you only pay say like 10%, I mean, maybe $10 more. Um, it's a very small increase. And so there's really not that much incentive to cut waste. And I actually know some families that will, will just sign up for one service between the two families because you pay so little for the second barrel that they basically are like, hey, we can save money by like signing up together. And so anyway. So I just wanted to raise that. And I think, you know, if when I actually looked at the pricing, I think if you have like one barrel or you have a barrel twice the size, the cost is very small. So if, if Amherst really does want to cut um, solid waste that it's collecting, it would be great if we could come up with some other pricing structure. So it was exciting to hear that Amherst is looking at options, including possibly something through the town. So thanks, that was it. Thank you, Tracy. Um, okay, we don't have any items not anticipated. Um, and I think that's it. Thank you. Uh, oh, Alyssa? We didn't give people a chance to ask Paul questions about the town manager report because oh. we moved that. Remember we moved it? Oh, oh, okay. Dated for us all this time. Right, Alyssa, did you have one? Did you have something? Yes, but I forgot what it was. Maybe somebody else does. I'm sorry. Yeah, I moved it and then I forgot it. Um, <laughs> anybody have any questions for Paul? I guess not. You're off the hook, Paul. Uh, <laughs> okay, I declare this meeting adjourned. See you later.